Up until this year, we didn't really have super good documentation on how to train mods. Um, earlier this year, myself, um, Renea, and, and some other mods took the document, documentation we had and compiled it into a handbook, which I update whenever we make rule changes. Um, that is something that every single new moderator has to read through, like 20 pages long. But it hits every single part of our system. Even junior mods who only deal with chat have to go through it, ask any questions. I'm in TeamSpeak with them for usually a week's time at the beginning of their you know, moderation time. And that's it. Um, it, it explains all of our systems, and then every time someone gets access to a new system, we sit down and we go over it, and we work with them. And then when they're ready to kind of take it on their own, we let them have a chance at it. Doesn't always work out great. Sometimes it does. You know, it, it, the idea though is that training is important, and, and you can't just expect people to know what you're looking for. If, if, as a streamer, you expect there to be certain rules and, and certain timeout rules and ban rules, and maybe you don't like people being banned in your channel, and maybe trolling is okay. And if that's the case, great, but you have to let your people know, because they're only going to do what they think is best. Absolutely. And also, you brought up a, a really good point that I don't think we've touched on too much, but a great tip for streamers and people managing mod teams is establish a person to help train new mods one of your most knowledgeable people that can help really get the ball rolling quickly, someone who's willing to be kind of like the go-to individual for new mods, for questions, and for and how to access different systems and stuff. But uh, yeah, it's it's. I'm thankful to have Boatman because he has a lot of professional experience behind this stuff that he's actually brought to the table. But in a lot of cases, just like you said, as long as you have an ear to listen and somebody who knows the systems well, most will be absolutely fine with that. Yeah. Um, I think the, the key thing to consider when you're actually doing mod selection is that you actually need to decide what works best for your channel. Like, uh, I, I like to say a lot that custom always wins. But for you, you might be able to use any given off-the-shelf application and it just fills in your needs. But the, the best thing to do for your channel is make decisions that are the best for your channel going forwards. And then you can decide how you want to recruit your mods based on that. Great, great advice. And also for us, I mean, one of the reasons we actually have a custom system is because there were so few systems available when I started kind of doing my streaming. They really hadn't caught on yet, but today there's so much competition between a lot of these kind of total package infrastructure programs you can get that there are some phenomenal options out there that if I would have started streaming today, there's a good chance I'd pick one of them up in a heartbeat. So definitely look around and don't necessarily think that custom is what you have to do. Of course, if you have the resources, it'll get you the most fine-tuned system, but not necessarily the best system. And again, it, it takes a lot of resources that a lot of people don't have, and time also. Our system is still evolving and has things that have been waiting. We've been, we've been working on and, and doing in the back end for years. We wanted our achievement system in two years ago. It got in like two months ago. So it's the kind of thing where a lot of times those box solutions could be a lot better for you and easier to train your new mods on. And uh, I think last time I checked, we must be closing on 100,000 achievements given out. Amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> one, one little footnote about uh, choosing mods or what I want to say is about applying for a mod is that so many people think that becoming a mod or applying for a mod is just fun and cool and whatnot. It is really a lot of work. So don't go into it or apply if you think you're just going to hang out, have fun, and chat and chat. Very stuff. true. It is, it is work, and please treat it like that. Absolutely. That, uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So moving on to the next question. Um, and this one's kind of for, for Barry, but there's an addendum for TriWar as well. Um, how do you coordinate and manage the building and maintenance of the overlays uh, for the stream, and how much control do you have over the content, and how did the system grow over time, where, where it was, how it started to where it is now? Magic. All right, great. <laughs> awesome. Um, so a follow-up to try. Uh, well, um, basically, the, the, the overlay system started because um, uh, some people made some changes to some other systems that we were using at the time, and we decided that we didn't want to use their system, system anymore. So I began working on an alternative for basically just doing stream notifications. And when we started rolling it out, we put the basic stream notifications on stream with the same art that we had at the time. And then Triwar turned around and went, hang on a minute, 
we can do different art for different yeah. games. <laughs> Back in the day when we used the old system, it was like you only had the option to implement like a single picture and that was it. So it dropped down, gave a name, and that's it. But we were like, hmm, we can do better since we do good custom now. So what, 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 I, what is the option? What can we do? Then Barry was like, hmm, what can you, th what, what, anything you can dream up with, I can make. So, okay. So starting out from that, um, we're still like evolving. Like every month I ask Barry, hey dude, is it possible that I do stuff like this in the overlay? He's like, hmm, I think so. So, and, and then like 20 minutes later, I th he's like, I think I figured out how it works. So we get something new into the overlay and then he had to like version up again, like on the back end, like, yeah. Yeah, so um, the, the overlay at the moment, it, it's, it's actually relatively basic um, in terms of actually getting information from A to B through the system in terms of the pipeline is fairly basic because all we have is just something monitoring chat, something monitoring the donation system, well, tip system, sorry, and then it just feeds notifications into the server and the server spits them out and the overlay animates it. The actual complexity is more to do with um, how we do the animation and how we cut up the art. So it, it varies game to game. Um, no, normally, code gives us more than a day's warning, which yeah, is nice. Yeah, at least a day's warning. We try. <laughs> <laughs> so most of the time. Yeah, most of the overlays you guys see on the, screen, on the stream is like two days in advance. Hey, dudes, I'm going to play this in this game. Do we have an overlay ready for it? No. It's like a chorus of... So, oh, so Barry is like <laughs> pulling an all-nighter to code it, it and I'm pulling an all-nighter to draw it, and then... Stuff happens on screen, and you all, you guys all clap and do the tech team six stuff. Oh yeah, we, it works. We, we do a pretty good job. Um, yeah. no, normally, we um, the, the the general production day to day is that Co decides that there are games coming up that he wants to play, and then Triwar comes up with the art, and um, Prop Danny B will listen to the um, original soundtrack and come up with sound, and then uh, we combine it all together. And then once I get everything, which is normally about six hours before we go live, <laughs> uh, I, I pull it all down, rip it, rip it, to, rip it to pieces in Photoshop, um, spin it through the spinner, and it all comes out the other end. And uh, generally, my average build time for any given overlay is about two hours flat. I, I've got it down to a fine art. Yeah, you started out like like eight, and then yeah, <laughs> then so, it um, went down. So the, 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 the first overlay that we really did a proper job on was Fallout, Fallout 4. 4. Yeah, and. I got home from work. Uh, I was actually on vacation for that week, so uh, I got home from work, sat down, pulled the art down, and went, this is going to take a while. Are you a serious and dude? Ba yeah. Basically, I, I, th I think I did about 12 hours overnight, and I was still finishing it whilst Co was doing the intro. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> and then, of course, the first giveaway started, and then literally everything fell over. <laughs> It was done. But we, we, what, we had like 60,000 people in chat and like everyone's system crashed. <laughs> there was so many people in yeah. chat. But thankfully, I mean, you were covered in, I think, under half an hour. Yeah. We were back in we business. Back you actually recoded that part of the overlay and then re-pushed it, reset it, so. It's, uh, it's, 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 uh, I, I think I've done a fairly good job on the overlay. I've not had any major complaints because like, we, we, we can do game switching um, so Co, Co likes to do at the moment, he does um, whatever game he's doing in the afternoon, then does maybe an hour of Rainbow Six. So we have to do a, a live switch of the overlay, which we can do, which is sometimes if you're watching the stream, you'll see a little bar at the top that all says preloading, yeah. and it's just preloading all the assets. And I think uh, with the advent of bits, I'm up to about 5,000 assets for every overlay. Wow. <laughs> but um, that, that's just how that I deal with animating the bits icon. I, I, I don't use the GIFs because GIFs yeah, can be moved to, uh, to control. Yeah, we moved away from GIFs because yeah. they just look, yeah. So everything that you see that is animated is actually not animated. They are like little assets that are moved in real time on screen. So we, we, cool. we, we, we use uh, multiple different technologies. Um, and uh, hopefully, we'll be coming up with uh, Super Overlay 2.0. Sometime. Watch hopefully this by, the, by the end of October, hopefully. Uh, I'm going to be working on it on the plane home. 
Awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, we've, uh, we, as you guys know, we have a default overlay, which is kind of, it's, it's the coalition themed overlay that we use for any game we don't have uh, an, an actual themed overlay for. And uh, Barry and Triwar have been working for the last actually couple months and will be this month on a, on a kind of brand new default overlay, which we're going to start implementing and tying into our achievement system. So actually, you know, if you have certain achievements and you say hello or you sub or resub or tip, your notification may actually have unique things happen to it, like it may be all gold or sparkly or have a glowing border and things like that, depending on what you've unlocked on the site. So all this coordination would not be possible without that backing in art. So. Looking so forward to it. It's, it's going to be, be a, great. a huge technology upgrade yes. as well because we're going to change how we do a lot of stuff. But I, th I think a lot of people who do use overlays, I don't think there's anyone actually out there who does scene switching. Like yeah, uh, with with Fallout, Fallout 4 as an example, whenever Ko gets into power armor, he can switch to his power armor scene and the assets and all the bits and pieces on screen, they all move around and change color. And actually, that's a great lead into our next question uh, for Triwar in particular. How are you able to make the overlays fit so seamlessly with the games? And in some cases, you do it for games that haven't been released yet. So on day one, all the UIs will actually fit into place. And as you know, we get questions all the time, like, what is that timer on the screen? And what does that little tube yeah. there mean? And you know, that's all stuff that you guys created. So how do you, how do, you do that? What's your process for that? Well, my process, my, my process is usually um, diving into YouTube, watching videos of stuff that is released, and hoping that they don't change the UI from the beta, <laughs> from the beta stuff that is which, leaked. Which has happened. Which, which has actually happened, so like, oh or, shit. Or you change the scaling on the UI. Yeah, or, or Go changes the scaling. I gotta so, read my text, I'm an old man. Yeah, <laughs> so um, like I go into that stuff usually like a week before the actual game launches, and then um, I'm trying to figure out how we can place the elements that we need into a, a moon, to a, into a scene that actually works on screen and that it's not, um, yeah, like if the drop it drops down, it doesn't look uh, awkward or stands out, it just blends in, like into, a, to not destroy your guy's immersion, I guess. And most importantly, you, you also, because uh, we've talked about this in the past, make sure to avoid every important element on the UI. Yeah, so absolutely. So nothing will drop down or uh, cover the mini-map. That, that's one of the reasons why people think our stuff blends in with into, with into the UI, like, like the little train thing or whatever. Mm -hmm. And people are like, hmm, why is that thing there? Because they expect it to be part of the interface, but it's actually our overlay sneaked into there. So yeah, that's... that's um, I, when I started doing it, it was just like um, I, I just put it anywhere. But now these days, um, I'm trying to get it really integrated into there, and it it, it looks awesome. I think so. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. Like the, the actually, it was it was pretty funny. We just recently did a Bioshock collection playthrough, oh, yeah. and uh, he put the subtrain as a bar with the same graphics under them. And I can't tell you how many times people ask, like, I didn't know Bioshock had speed running. Like, why is that timer <laughs> going down? Like, that's cool. I remember a blue and a red, but what's that green bar? Like, we, I oh, seriously don't have, uh, yeah. Yeah, was, only have a timer? What, I know, what exactly. Was like, on? this is a collection thing, isn't it? You know, like, oh, man, it was, it was good. But having that seamless stuff definitely, definitely helps. Um, so this is kind of back to the general mod team here. Uh, what tools do you guys as moderators find the most useful when mostly managing chat? The bot. The bot. Barry says the bot jokingly, but it's actually true. The, having a quality bot set up well for what you do is going to be your best mod. We, we can do everything in between, and uh, of course, we're a human element that allows us to go in and, and see things that the bot doesn't necessarily hit, but the bot's going to be your workhorse. It's doing most of the work. In our channel, we have mul multiple bots that handle different systems, um, and it really allows, it, it frees us up to chat more, to be more integrated with people, to handle things like taking in giveaways that take time and take us out of chat. So anything that the bot can do that we don't need to is great, like warning people when they have to deal with caps, and we have a progression system for that. So first it warns them, then it purges them, then it times them out for 10 minutes, and if they haven't figured that out by then, they get a permanent ban. It's not really super complicated, but you know, it's, it's a tool that is great in use. We, most of all of our mods use BTTV as well. Um, which is an option that exists, and um, it allows you to 
you know, have extra tools and different aliases for quicker purging or banning. Um, Twitch has actually increased their systems in just vanilla to allow you to add reasons, which is great. People kind of want to know why they got smashed in the face. It, you know, oftentimes they don't have any clue or think they did anything wrong. You know, what you think is bad isn't necessarily what your viewers are going to think is bad.